Good morning, Family Life. How are we doing this morning? I am doing well, a lot better than I was last week. Thank you for the privilege of not shaking your hand last week because you didn't want to shake my hand last week. You would have caught something you didn't want. The, uh, I brought something up here. I'll show it to you in just a moment. It's one of the rarest things somebody could ever have. It's really hard to get. It's, uh, if you play any sports at all, I feel a little loud. It sounds good to me, but if it's fine to you guys, it's good with me. The, uh, uh, every team wants one, and almost no team has one. Uh, it's something we want in our life. It's a symbol of being undefeated. This is a 1972 Miami Dolphins pennant. All of my family lives in the same county in Ohio, except one aunt who's passed away. She lived down in Florida. So whenever she came back to visit, she always brought something. The only thing we knew about in Florida was Miami Dolphins. Well, 1972, for those of you that are in the know, Miami Dolphins went undefeated, which would seem like it's a common thing, you know? No team has done it since then. Many teams have tried. Every team tries every year to go undefeated. I checked the stats this year. 32, I think, I think it was 32 NFL teams. Three of them were undefeated after three games. 29 of them failed after three games. And after the fourth game, none of them were undefeated. None. And we would love to live an undefeated life. Yet none of us have. Most of us haven't lived an undefeated week, have we? <laughs> There's things that, that hop, hop up and remind us about the defeats in our life. And this time of the year, the holiday season, seems to multiply those defeats, especially even if they're in the past. Some of those defeats might be in the past, or some of them may have been just a couple months ago, and the holidays come, and it seems to amplify it all. We've all got defeats. Maybe directions we wish we had never gone that took us to destinations we never wanted to be at, and they bring us a reminder of a defeated decision that maybe we made. And we think everyone else is holding up their undefeated tag because they got, they got the fakeness going on really good, but none of us in the room are undefeated. <laughs> this season, there may be gifts you can't buy because of past defeats in your life that have to do with a job loss, poor credit management, or changing your major 14 times and taking three semesters of classes you're still paying for in your 30s. Defeats that we wish we never had. Maybe there's plans you can't make this holiday season. You can't make the plan to go to so-and-so's house because you're not related to so-and-so anymore. Because of a defeat in a family situation. Because of a relationship situation you wish you would have handled better, wiser, kinder, and you're not able to wave this over your house because hardly anybody does. Maybe there's been some emotional or health defeats in your life. Opportunities you let slip. Choices that bring about ugly consequences sexually, financially, relationally, educationally. And this season seems to put those choices in a megaphone. And it seems like we wear them all over our hearts. A direction maybe you wish you hadn't taken left you at a destination you wish you weren't at. And this season amplifies it. A season where fake is flaunted all over the place where perfect is paraded and elation seems everywhere, when we feel defeated, how can we still walk in hope in the holidays? Isn't that little baby supposed to bring joy to the world? Isn't he supposed to bring joy? How do we have joy when none of us can wave this over our life? What is that Savior going to be able to do for us today, now, when we've lived in a way that is not undefeated? Jesus knew, that Savior, that baby in the manger knew that we would face defeats. We would face disappointments, losses. We would have situations that are difficult. So if you came today and you're hoping for a message about how perfect everything is in life, uh, Oprah's on channel 47, I think, <laughs> or you can go find something else. We're going to talk about some real life stuff here. And Jesus said this in John chapter 6, jingle bells, John chapter 16. I told you this stuff. Everything I've told you, I told you these things. So that in me, you may have an undefeated life. No. You know, peace. In this world, you'll be undefeated. No, in this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart. I kicked the world's tail to the curb. I defeated the world. I overcame the world. I lived undefeated. And in me, you can be overcome that world. In me, you can have that peace. So if you have your bulletins, pull them out. I'm going to follow along this morning. I'm talking about facing defeat when we feel defeated whether you're in the midst of a defeat situation or not. if you didn't get a bullet and lift your hand up we'll get you one where do defeats come from defeats come from natural causes 
We are broken people in a broken world. Sinful natural causes. We do wrong things. Other people do wrong things. Bad things happen in our life. We face defeat or feel defeat, not because God is unfair, but because life is unfair. Those things happen, and they come to everybody we know. Sometimes we feel defeated because of unrealistic expectations, expectations that are impossible to meet. And then we fall short. The crazy thing is this. We set an expectation up here, and we get close to it, make forward progress, but we feel defeated because we fell short of an amazing goal. And we refuse to look at how far we've come. Instead, we look about how we didn't make it to where we thought we should be, so that way the Facebook post would really look good, and all our friends would be envious of us. Yeah, yeah, unrealistic expectations. I mean, who's got six-pack abs? All of us want them. All of us think it would be great. So if you have someone nearby you that has six-pack abs, would you please take a moment and point at them? Randy Burke, I know you do. All right, who else? Who, who else has six? Jamal, I know you do. Don't be, don't be shy on me. You're not running, running back fit state and not having six-pack Who else has six-pack abs? Come on. Okay, so less than 1% of us do. Does that mean we're all failures? I'm going to walk around like a failure the rest of my life because I don't have six-pack abs. I am such a loser. Unrealistic expectations. Do you want a dream for them? Sure. Photoshop. Put them on. But nobody gets it all done, and nobody accomplishes everything, and nobody lives undefeated. Another reason for (laughs) defeats that we face, a common enemy. He's working for our defeat, friends. He screams, you are a failure. When failure is not a person, failure is an event. He screams, failure is final, though failure is almost never fatal. He screams and we cower and we listen as if he has the last rule. But I believe my Jesus said he's overcome the world. Not Satan overcame Jesus and not Satan overcame us. We don't need to listen to what he has to say. The last word doesn't go to our common enemy. The last word goes to the victor. So, a couple questions for you today. What if I didn't let defeat define me? What if I didn't let defeat define? Me. I can't stop defeat. They're going to happen. I'm not going to be waving this. They're going to happen. But what if I didn't let it define me? And I was putting these notes together. I thought, I have a personal illustration I need to share. Literally 14 years ago, in two days, we, uh, we put all the stops out as the new pastors at Family Life. We've been here six months. And we put all the stops out to put on the best, biggest Christmas service we could. We were meeting in the rented facility in front of a quality floor up by Mola Chevrolet. We did everything that we could. And for us at that time, we put a front page color ad on the newspaper. People read the newspaper. It was important at that time. They had 10, 10, 000, a circulation of 10000 It cost us 120 bucks to put that first full color ad in the front. And that $120 was probably close to about uh, 10% of a week's worth of income for the church. We did that. We brought in a, uh, the local radio station, which wasn't Caleb at the time. He did a, a one-man drama that was excellent. We brought Dave Garrison in for that. We promoted that. So you don't even have to listen to your pastor preach. We're going to have a drama. It's going to be awesome. I mean, I, I knew I was hitting the right buttons. I knew this was a good thing to do. It bombed. We even had stage lights on the floor that we could plug into the wall. It was so cool. We walked out of the little side room when we got done praying, and, and Dave's in the back still putting, finishing his makeup stuff. And I walk out, and now the, the stories can be apocryphal, depending on what you want to Well, there was two people there. There was only four. I went back and looked at the actual numbers this morning. There was 16 with the adults and two in the nursery. That's it. Out of the 18 people, three of them were my family, and one was Dave. 14 total people showed up. 14. Am I going to let defeat define me? Some of you know this story well because you were one of the 14. <laughs> I tried hiding it from my face. Oh, yeah, by the way, six of them were on the platform trying to lead worship <laughs> to eight people sitting out there. It'd be a good opportunity to let defeat define me. Even though defeat, excuse me, even though failure is an event, it's not a person. It'd be a good opportunity to realize that's it. Let's just quit. We've tried six months. We did everything we could. It's not getting any better. Let's just jet. But it wasn't final. But it felt that way. Because some of the harshest words we say are words we say to ourselves. Layman, you moron. Why'd you do that? Can't you figure out that you should have done that before the campus went on, spring br- on, on winter break? I look at that back of that now and see that. 
I don't know you real well. I don't know all your story. I don't know how you feel about yourself today, but I know two things about you. Number one thing I know about you is the person that's most qualified to deceive you is yourself. And number two, I know how God feels about you. He wrote it in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It says this. If you're feeling defeated, let this sink in. Long before he laid the earth's foundations, he had you in mind. I'll personalize it. He had settled on you as the focus of his love. To be made whole and holy by his love. Not to be made whole and holy by your undefeated life. To be made whole and holy. So two defining questions for you today. Number one, who am I listening to? Who am I listening to? The first Christmas, Mary gets a visit from an angel. And the angel comes and says to her, this amazing statement says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Those words don't fit. Mary. Highly favored, that's, that's a term for royalty. The Lord is with her. She doesn't see anything in her life that says the Lord is with her. Those words don't fit. How is she going to put those words on? That must be for somebody else. That must not be for her. She has to decide who she's going to listen to. God says things about you that when you're feeling defeated, you don't think they fit your heart, your mind, and your life. But if you'll get him inside, his words can start not just fitting you, but molding you so they fit you like a glove. You are of immeasurable worth to him. And your current circumstances have never determined his feelings towards you. He loves you with passion and without regret. He cannot love you anymore, and he's chosen not to love you any less. If God has a fridge, your picture's on it. Legit. Unless it's digital fridge, then I don't know what he's doing there, man. Why is it God says things about us and we casually forget them and don't think they matter, but parents, spouses, teachers, mentors, coaches, bosses, coworkers say things and it sticks to our heart like graffiti? Why do we so casually throw off his words and let the others stick so tightly? Whose voice needs to be removed from my life? Ask yourself that. Whose voice needs to be removed from my life? Mary, if she would have shared this with everybody, hey, an angel told me I was highly favored by God, would have had 40 people tell her, you're nuts, woman. Whose voice needs to be removed from your life? You may not be able to remove them physically, and you may not even be able to remove them audibly. But why do they have the impact in your life that they do? Maybe it has to do with question number two. Whose approval do I desire? Whose approval do I desire? Do you remember junior high? I know you tried blotting it out, but think with me. Try it, try it. Who did you want to approve of you in junior high? Remember how powerful those approvals or disapprovals affected you? And as you've grown, some of that has changed, but some of that hasn't. We still have the need and the desire for approval, and I don't know from my understanding of the Scripture that that's wrong to have. It all depends whose approval I'm desiring. Desiring approval is natural. It's normal. But whose approval is going to dictate whether that's a healthy thing or not? With the holidays in season, whose approval you, decide, you desire that maybe you've never received? Maybe it's a mom or a mother-in-law that's going to come by and nitpick your house. And all you want to hear is, I approve of how you decorate. It looks nice. And you would just like almost, almost give up all your Christmas presents for those words. Maybe it's a dad who reminds you of all your past mistakes and all you want to hear is, I'm proud of you. Not I'm proud of you, but just I'm proud of you. Or maybe it's a child who's going to blame you for their current misfortunes and all you want to hear is, I forgive you. I hope to God you get to hear that. And go in with hope high, and I hope that approval comes. But if it doesn't, and you have a defeat, what are you going to do? You hope these people will change, but they may never change. They may give you what you want, what you need, what you deserve, but they may not. Do you have to have their approval? Or can you move forward and still have joy in your life? You may have had unpleasable parents, but please don't project that onto God because he's not an unpleasable God. You can have his approval. Is his approval what you're seeking? Because here's the crazy thing about approval. It answers this question. Who do I want to have power over my life? Who do I want to have power over my life? Anyone I look to for approval has power over my life. If you don't believe that, look at your yearbook and how you cut your hair and the clothes you wore. 
Some of you should look at those and go, just shoot me now. I can't believe I wore that in that picture. Just shoot. I can't believe it. Some of you, some of you ladies had Big Bang Theory going on in your hair a long time ago. <laughs> why did, some of you guys are going, you just wish you had bangs right now. But why did you wear, have your bangs out to here? Whose approval were you desiring? You're, want, you're wanting the approval of those around you. In 30 years, if someone puts a picture up, hey, this is what churches did back in the 2014s, they're going to go, seriously, a table? How stupid, how moronic, how early 2000s that was. They're going to laugh at the way we do things. Who cares? But right now, anyone I'm looking to for approval has power over my life, which means they've won my heart. And I don't think I like that. I know I don't like back looking at junior high and seeing whose approval I was trying to win, thinking that they had control over my heart, but they did. Because I was willing to do whatever would please them. Because I wanted their pleasure. I wanted their approval. Who's won your heart? Who do you want to win your heart? Last question. I think it's the last one. Where would I be if I had allowed defeat to transform me instead of deform me? See, when defeat comes, we usually take it like a, like a slap to the face. And sometimes it defeats hard. If it's public, we never feel like we're the same again. You know, after a really, really hard defeat, we shouldn't be the same again. We should be changed. But it's really not up to defeat, and it's not up to Satan whether that, whether that defeat transforms us or deforms us. That's up to us surrendering to the power of God in the midst of that defeat. What does the world do with defeat? Hide it! It's embarrassing! I can't believe you were, don't let anybody know that happened to us. Don't let anybody know that happened to you. And we hide defeat. We get, get past it as fast as you can. Hurry, go do something you can do well just so you can feel good about yourself. They're victory junkies. They're addicted to victory. As if having a victory is the only way we can feel good about ourselves. And we can't feel good about ourselves based on a Savior coming to die for us and looks at us and says, you are the object of my love. Because we're not always going to have victories are we we're not called to copy the world joy can't be based on personal victories if you're only happy and joyful when good happens you're going to be unhappy and unjoyful most of your life because no one experiences only good that's a quote from purpose driven life i hope you finished it i finally got got it finished this past week that's like on day 41 it's good God says we're all going to have problems. We're all going to have defeats. None of us are going to hang this over our house. But he wants us to comfort us in those defeats and transform us through them. Not just get past them, but grow through them. And defeat doesn't make problems good. But it makes God good, even in the midst of those problems. See, an exchange has to happen. And some of you are really good at exchanges. You, call, you do it December 26th at Walmart. You're all set to make exchanges. You open that gift, and you've got the smile on because the cameras are rolling. Thank you, Aunt Matilda Beulah Bottom Hildegard. That's exactly what I wanted. And you're going, I hope there's a gift receipt because it's going back. It's going to get returned. If you've got something in your life from a defeat you wish you didn't have, I'm going to ask you to change modes for a moment. You've been listening to me. Please stop. And for the next few moments, would you simply receive? Instead of trying to listen and process, receive with your heart a couple passages from Scripture. If you're defeated today, listen to what God wants to do for you. You can read it on the screen, but I'd encourage you not to. I'd encourage you to close your eyes and just listen. He wants to bestow, bestow on you a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Feel like you got ashes all around in your life right now? He wants to give you a crown of beauty. He didn't ask you if you thought you deserved it. He wants to give it. He wants to give you the oil of gladness instead of that mourning and sadness that you have. But I know that sadness is easier to hold on to, but that's not what he wants you to hold on to. He wants to give you a garment of praise instead of that spirit of despair you're carrying around. Your world is screaming to you and says joy is a life without defeat. But God says bring me your defeat and I can still give you joy. This exchange is ready to happen when there's a change in our hearts. He says he wants to take that heart that you've got and remove it from you and give you a heart of flesh. That heart of stone, that heart that is shut down, that heart is not talking to anybody, that heart has got the fakeness down good. He wants to remove it from you. 
the heart that is hard because of defeats and you didn't make it perfect? And then there's this passage in Ephesians I want to read to you. Whether you're feeling defeated or not this morning, listen to what Paul, the apostle, prays for you. He says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. How do you feel when you're defeated? Not strong, that's for sure. He wants to strengthen you with power through his spirit. Not through your goodness, not through your wins, not through how awesome you've done and God's so happy how good you've been this week. Strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, not on the fake, not on the outside. Why? So Christ can dwell in your heart by faith, not by goodness, not by having an undefeated week or even an undefeated morning. But that's not all. Paul's not done. He says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, something that's rooted and established doesn't get bounced around too easy, that you may have power together with all the saints, all those that you think are super spiritual. That way you can grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And that's not all. That you can know his love that goes beyond anything else you know. And that's not all. And that you may be filled, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, and you can kick defeat to the curb. You don't have to walk in that anymore. That undefeated season of life you keep dreaming of, it ain't happening. It's not coming. But that change of heart can free your heart to exchange junk for joy, and that's what's being offered to you today. Worship team, can you come, please? A change of heart can free your heart to exchange junk for joy. That change in your heart can change who your heart is listening to. That change you need can change whose approval you are desiring. And that change can change who is being granted power in your life. And that change of heart is what he did in me. That change of heart. What if you let God's voice define you? His word define you. His presence define you and not your defeats. Some of you have had a hard time looking in the mirror. You're having a hard time even looking at me right now. What if you let God's voice define you and not your defeats? What if those new defeats that are going to come and the defeat you're walking in right now, and we're not saying, just pretend it's not there. It's not really a defeat. No, it is. And it stinks. And it's there. We're not saying pretend. Pretend. There's enough people saying pretend. We're saying be real and let his power come in. And what if that defeat transformed you instead of made you walk with a limp in your heart the rest of your life? I wish that defeat never happened. I'm looking over some of you. I know your stories. I wish that defeat had never happened. But it has. And here we are. And we have this baby in a manger. And we have this man on a cross. And we have this empty tomb. So what are we going to do?